We come together basically for one reason, and that is to get real. Because most of the time in our lives, we feel that others demand us to act in a way that's not real. Society demands we put on a happy face and we act in certain ways that fit the context, the family system, social order, etc., etc. But a time comes when one questions all of that and says, okay, that's a role that I'm playing, or a number of different roles, but is there anybody under all those roles? Is there any real being? What am I really? And it's when you start to ask that question, what am I really, if anything at all, that a path like this becomes interesting. Until then, it would seem very boring to sit and meditate and do nothing. But when you begin to wonder, what is real about me? Because everything on your driver's license, your passport, and all of that. That's not really you. We know that. And your body's not really you. And it's changing all the time. I mean, I look at this hand now, and it's the hand of an old man ready to die. It used to be a young man's hand. What happened to that? I don't feel any older. It's almost over, though, isn't it? Some of you who have young bodies may think that's some inherent status, and you'll always be young. <laughs> You're in for a rude shock. <laughs> Goes like that, and you'll have a wrinkled hand like this one. So the body is not real. It's very temporary, isn't it? And then what? And what were we before this body ever came out of someone's womb and started to cry? What more is there to life than this apparent world that doesn't have all that much to show for itself at the end of the day or the lifetime, unless you found the deeper dimension of what is real. And so that's the question that we all have to answer for ourselves. Some people may accept a religious answer, but these days most people are too smart for that. Nor a scientific answer, because science doesn't even go there except in a nihilistic way, there is nothing beyond the material, phenomenal plane. But even consciousness, the fact that you are conscious, is something extraordinary. And when you think about it, you realize that consciousness is the only, I shouldn't say thing, it's not a thing, but it's the only element of your reality that doesn't change. Your mind changes, the contents of your consciousness do. You have different ideas today, hopefully, than you had 20 years ago. And you will have different ideas in the future. So your ideas change. You can't be defined by your ideas. And most of them aren't real either. They're just things you heard about and decided to believe in. And usually you find out too late that it wasn't true. So your, your mind isn't real, it's just a flux of impermanent thoughts that ultimately don't refer to any deeper reality of a self. They're mostly imported from other people based on their ideas of what you should think you are to suit their needs. So if the body is not real, and the mind isn't real, and neither of them have any real reference to you, and the only thing that remains unchanging is something that doesn't even have a form at all, it's simply awareness, then that's the only place to explore. It's very clear, and why all of the sages, philosophers of all the West and East have agreed that, okay, if we're, if we're going to find anything real at all, we're going to find it in our awareness. 
We're not going to find it out there in any object of the senses or in any ideas. We're not going to find it in any entity. And even if we believe in an entity and feel the presence of an entity or even of God, that still doesn't answer the question of what is the relationship of this I or this self or whatever you think you are to that ultimate reality. Is it different from it or is it ultimate reality? Are you that or are you a cousin of that or the only begotten son of that or some other relationship to that? But this question can only be answered then by being willing to dive deeply into your awareness and not hold on to the surface level, which is where language takes place. And because all language will give you, all the thoughts in your mind will give you, is a fictional idea of who you are. And usually a rigid, fixed one that was determined in childhood. You're like this, and then it never changes. Because that gives you a sense that you really exist as a being that is describable. And yet, of course, you know it's not true. Now, knowing it's not true and letting go of it are two different things. So most people hold on to this fixed idea of who they are, even though they, not, they know it's not true. Because they're afraid if they let go of it, then they really are in trouble. Because they will be completely without an identity. This is called neurosis. When you hold on to things that you know are not true, but you're afraid to let them go. It's also called the human condition. So, we're here to take the risk of letting go of what you know isn't true anyway. Including letting go of the body. You're going to have to let go of it someday anyway. If you want to die in peace whenever that day comes, you have to practice now. Socrates said that in ancient Greece. He said, all philosophy is just practice dying every day so that you're not afraid when the time really comes. You've already gone through the routine, like a fire drill. So that's all meditation really is, is you practice letting go of your identification with the body and with the mind and ask yourself, but wordlessly, because you're letting go of language, what am I? When there's no more thinking going on in the mind and there's no more action for the body, what's left that is real? That may actually transcend time and space. Because if you read Immanuel Kant and other philosophers <coughs> before and since, the deepest ones, have discovered logically, and they make a very good case for it, that space and time are both illusions. They're categories of consciousness, but they are categories that only apply within the realm of the mind, that structure our, uh, our perceptions. But they are not ultimate realities. And so, whatever is real in us then is beyond the illusion of space and of time. And therefore, it has called, been called transcendent. And the, the good part about realizing that what is real in you is this transcendent self is that you don't have to do anything to reach it. But you do have to not do anything to reach it. Because anything you do takes you away from it since it is not a thing that does anything. And so as soon as you start wanting to think about or do something, you've lost the awareness that is the witness of all of that that we've seen as an illusion. And that's what takes courage and strength and concentration and persistence to not do anything, to not be diverted from this unknowable self that you are that you cannot know conceptually because it's not a thing and it's not separate from you to be able to look at from a distance. But because it is you, you can be it when you don't divert from that which you are. 
into some fiction. Well, it's very simple. Just be, without creating narratives, without making it difficult on yourself, by saying, oh, I can't do this, other people can do it, but I'm not good enough, I don't deserve it, blah, blah, blah. That I is the fictional I that you have to recognize is not you. But to sit in that silence and let go of everything you pretended to believe you were and discover the emptiness. And only then will you know if you're a nihilist or you believe in the fullness of God and if reality is truly non-dual or not. But you won't know it until you are it. And the only question is, do you want to know it or don't you? Do you want to be agnostic or an agnostic? If you don't know it, you've got to take somebody else's word for it. And until you know what you are, you won't know how to be in the world. And there will always be fear. And there will always be some inaccuracy. Because if you don't identify as who you really are, you're going to create a fictional identity that sooner or later will not be adequate to the demands of reality. Therefore, we have to get real if we're going to face what is real with real courage and real wisdom, real intelligence. Because the same intelligence that is behind all of this out there that we feel we are within is us, is the same intelligence that we are. But you won't know that for sure until you've let go of the fictional pseudo-intelligence of the ego that's crashing around, bumping into walls here and there, looking for itself, until you have found yourself and don't need an ego to crash around and have experiences that only bring suffering. And that's when you say, okay, let's put that illusion to rest. And so if you're interested in not suffering and not wondering, but of knowing the truth, then you have to be willing to be still. And what you discover is that stillness is actually very enjoyable. It's not this horrible boredom. <laughs> it's not the terror of some black hole that you're going to be sucked into. It's not any of the fantasies that we tend to create about ultimate reality. But it is indescribable, so I won't even try to do that. But I invite you to be still in your natural state of who you are, really, without projecting that you're something else, and then just observing what arises in that space. Because all the sages say that it's bliss. And that in that consciousness, you enter another dimension of reality in which very many miraculous events occur. And different laws of nature operate. And that there is so much to learn from that dimension once you cross the portal from the false into the real self. That those who have gone there have chosen not to come back. But those who have brought back messages from that ultimate reality are all in agreement that it is grace, it is beatitude, it is ultimate beauty and love. So I hope you take this invitation tonight to experience who you are and all the blessings that come with that. So let's meditate.